of this thing here. Yeah, this is, I don't think I need this as well. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. Uh, I hope this will be slightly different than what you otherwise seen in the serverless conference. Because uh, in some sense, we're going to talk about the real serverless, as in, you are offline, there is no server. <laughs> um, of course, that's not entirely true, but uh, um, it's, it's an interesting context, and it should at least give you a diff kind of different perspective. So a little bit about me. I mean, you mentioned I'm the CEO of a company called Realm. Before that, um, I worked for many, many years as a mobile engineer at Nokia. Uh, tons of work on how to like make data work effectively on mobile devices. So I have like far, far too long experience with working on mobile, like pre-iPhone, back when it was like these small feature phones where you're all like working with these small displays and doing all kinds of things. It's, uh, it's kind of crazy how much mobile have changed in, in all these years. But it does give a kind of different perspective, just thinking of things from a real mobile perspective. So I'm coming from the perspective of Realm, so everything, of course, is uh, kind of a bit biased from that, of course. Um, so wh what is Realm? Well, Realm actually started as a mobile database. Right? It was a database that only ran on the mobile device, like something you use within your app, like replacement for SQLite and core data and all those things uh, that people use to build uh, apps. So we wanted to build like a real mobile, um, a real object database that worked. So that was hugely popular, and then a lot of people are using that. And we just recently we launched a, a backend that to mirror that, that allows you to like allow you to like synchronize your data totally transparently, just share data between devices and backends uh, in a transparent way. And that comes into what I'm going to talk about. Um, it, it's most of it is open. Like most of the whole platform is open source. You can go up, the whole database is totally open source. You can go on GitHub and download it, play with it. Um, it's very, very popular. One of the, the things that you probably want to see, since it's a database, is something that's kind of hidden, but it's really everywhere. I'm pretty sure that almost all of you are using Realm today in some capacity. I mean, we are everywhere. If you know, like, if almost every like, big company out there is using Realm in some capacity within their apps. So one thing that this gives us, it gives us a really, really huge perspective of how people are building mobile apps today, what kind of problems they run into, and how they really want to interact with the, between the apps and their servers. So one thing we kind of come into is that, that serverless is great. I mean, you guys, you've seen like tons of, of talks today. You've kind of had this uh, the epiphany of how nice it is to be in this serverless world. And f at least from our perspective, it's great for a few reasons. I mean, the main reason that serverless is so awesome is that it empowers the individual developer. And um, we see this, especially in the mobile space, where if you build a mobile app, it's really annoying when you, you want to have a new feature and you have to go back to your, like your backend team and say, oh, I need this uh, new endpoint for my REST API before I can do something. And then you have to wait for them to schedule that, implement that, and uh, start all over. It, it just slows down the whole process. If you can be the, as an individual developer, if you can just build things yourself without having to really interact with the backend, uh, if you can just as, as an, use the same models, the same language as you're doing, and you can just say, oh, I want the backend to do this, and you don't have to work with the backend team, that makes a huge, huge difference. Um, and it just may allow you to build apps so much faster if, if you don't have this split, basically, between the, the front and backend. So the cool thing about serverless is that it just gives you this, uh, as uh, always the oxymoron about serverless, of course it is a server, but as a, from a developer's perspective, it's not something you have to think of as a server. It's just a service that you, oh, you can just update it and you can make it react to your changes. You can have like, all the triggers and stuff to, to do stuff when you change things. And the cool thing is also it gives you all these different services you can integrate with. There's all these cool things that people have built out there that you can just plug into. Uh, tons of services. All the big vendors have tons of different services. There are specialized services. It's all out there. It, it's, it's an amazing world. But, again, it, it, there's a, this thing of suddenly you go to mobile and it's like, is it really as easy as, as it looks? And you say, well, why more? Why not just say, well, I, I see a lot of the talks here where there's a lot of talk about the... Uh, people, a lot of people are still kind of in the web perspective. but 
I mean, if you look, everything is moving to mobile. I mean, these are kind of recent stats of how much time people spend online and how it, it's in, uh, developing. And as you see, the, like, the, the time people spend in, in the browser is, stays pretty stable. It's about this, has, doesn't have that much development. But the large majority of people's time, which is really what counts, is spent in mobile apps. I mean, not in the, in, in the browser on mobile, because that's counted as well here, that's the, the, the yellow bar, but actually in actual apps. That is really the majority of the time, which means that if you want to capture people's attention, you really have to be in a mobile app. Um, but building mobile apps is very, very different from the web. I mean, there, there's fundamental differences. And the main thing that comes in is this, that First of all, mobile networks has much higher latency than your local connections. Um, it's actually, you'll, if you actually measure it, you'll be really surprised how high the latency is. Because every single round trip goes back and forth. It has to go over all these networks and all the, the wireless, the cellular network. And a single like, HTTP REST request can take up to half a second uh, if you're on dog. But that's even on a 4G network. So, being in that voice, when, when you, that really affects how you build your APIs. Because if you have like, these kind of long segas of like, multiple REST requests before something happens, I mean, that, that can just slow down to a crawl when you're on a mobile network. And we're even talking about good no mobile networks, because most mobile networks have great bandwidth today. So you can stream data great. That's, that's awesome. Uh, but the moment you do like, a lot of back and forth, like all these REST calls, things can just slow down to a halt. Um, so, so that's one thing to be aware of. Also, the really big thing, of course, the almost like the defining feature of, of mobile is that you can, you can risk connectivity gone anytime. And not only it can cut off, which you'll see, I mean, anybody who's been in the train, on the plane, or just driving outside the city has tried that where connectivity just goes. But even worse, it goes kind of up and down. I mean, you have connectivity, and sometimes it's fast, sometimes it's slow, sometimes it kind of goes on and off, like intermittently, sometimes it's perfect, and sometimes it's just totally gone. And you can just not count on connectivity when you have a mobile device. And that is kind of the, the nature of the beast, right? It's the, the, almost the defining feature of being mobile. It's just that sometimes you are available, sometimes you're not. So in, in many ways, you can think of that as just as, as a different aspect of latency. It means that sometimes it's going to take a really long time to get a, a reply. Sometimes it's going to be quick. And you can't really predict wh which part of it is going to be. And then the last thing that really surprises many people when they start building apps is that your app can be shut down and restarted at any time. I mean, especially on Android, you will see that if there's a high load on the memory, and you'll see that on many devices, especially in Asia, where people have devices with very little memory, it'll just shut down the app all the time and, and then restart it. Um, so, I mean, you just swipe away from, from the app and it gets shut down and you swipe back and it's restarted transparently. But what happens if you are in the middle of a REST request while you're doing that? Because you're doing stuff. It's, it's really, I mean, that, that gets troublesome. So, so what you see is that <coughs> protocols like REST gets really brittle and cumbersome in the mobile world. And I mean, our experience is, I mean, we've seen again many comments that it works fine to begin with. I mean, you can build an app, You'll do all the, everything works perfectly because in, when you're testing in your own lab, you have perfect connectivity. The app is, of course, running, it's running, and, and similar. everything just works. And, but then you start hitting the edge cases when you actually get out in the wild and you'll get like weird bug reports that you can never reproduce because it's all these like weird, weird timing issues. And I mean, what, let's, let's, to give like a simple example, like think of you want to build, a, you're in like in building a retail app and you want to build like a, a buy button. You're, you're in your shopping cart and you want to build a buy button. So the first thing you say is, okay, somebody clicks the buy button. What happens if you don't have any connectivity at that point? And you're like, hmm, oh, that kind of sucks. I still have to buy at some point. So maybe you'll queue up the, uh, the request and say, I'll, I'll do it later. So you have to like code up, you build a queue, and that's fine. Then you think, oh, actually, the app could get shut down. So I have to persist that queue as well. Because otherwise, you'll lose it the moment it gets shut down and, and up. Oh, more code, I have to like, persist that stuff. And then, then you wait and you have to, have to, kind of have to watch for, for connectivity to come back. And then the connectivity comes back and say, oh, cool, I'll send the request now. I have the queues, I'll send it off. You send off the request, and then you lose connectivity before you get a reply. And you're like, oh, did I just buy something or, or what? 
And then you have, have to go back and say, oh, I have to find a way to change. So you have to go back to your backend team and say, um, sorry, um, I need a better REST API. I need to like, add a token to this buy thing so I can later check whether I actually bought again. So I need another request, another REST endpoint that can tell me where I can say, did that token actually go through? Also, I kind of need to store that token persistently on the device so I know what order I was in the process of. And as you see, it kind of just kind of escalates from there. It's just like, oh, all this, how do I deal with all these situations? And it's just so brittle. I mean, yeah. And I mean, that's kind of what you see. It's kind of this kind of like, funny thing, the iceberg of REST, where at the top level, it's really simple. I just I send a request, I get a reply, update the UI. How, how hard can it be? And then you're just like, whoa, did you actually look on these, all the things that can go wrong in the process when, when you're in this situation where things just get shut on and off all the time? And it just becomes this explosive thing that most people, literally, they just ignore it. And they just say, oh, I don't want to think about that, really. Uh, and, they, and they just build the app. And, it, it, and again, it'll work 90% of the time, except for when it don't. <laughs> and then you have all these like, annoying reports. So, so that's the world we live in, where it's just like, oh, this, this, this really, really sucks. Uh, and especially in, in, the, in the world where you have, again, really, really complex things, where you do tons of requests, where, I mean, you, you do searches and stuff, where you get like tons of replies back, and you have all these requests that have to be coordinated in long sequences. You're like, oh, how, how do we deal with this, I mean, in the mobile world? So, so the big question, of course, is what can we do? I mean, is there, is there a better way? Is there a way to to work with this and, and, and kind of accept this problem and say, okay, how do we find something that would actually work in, in a world where networking is just not guaranteed? It just doesn't, you can't trust it, basically. So we've been working a lot with this because, I mean, we come from a different perspective. We came from, the, from a database perspective or even from, I would say, from a data perspective because we're, we are a database, but we're very different from every other database out there. We're really an object database, which, which is so close to the language that it's even hard to call a database. It's just objects. And the fact that they can be persisted and queried and all the things you do with the database is kind of like a side benefit. So when we think about this, we say, okay, what is it really we want? I mean, we're, we're connecting to this server, and we want to do something together with the server. So what is it really we want? And really what we want is we want them to just be able to share some state. In, in, a, in a manner that's kind of independent of, of connectivity. So really what we want to say, okay, we have all these mobile devices, they have data on them, and they want to do stuff. And then we have the servers. And really what we want is just to keep that kind of in <coughs> synchronized between them and say, okay, it should just be the same. So one solution we can, I mean, most people, they, they use this kind of real-time sync, they use it for like, basically for like database things, like you want to collaborate and you want to share data and all those things. That's all really cool. But one thing that we kind of noticed was that this becomes so much more powerful when you use this to replace your APIs. So if, if we kind of think about the same problem we had before with the, like with the shopping cart, where you know, say, okay, I want to, to buy something. If instead of saying, oh, I have all these REST APIs I have to connect to, the, the, thing, the other thing you could do is you can just say, okay, I have some shared data with my, my server. What if I just post an object to that and the server can react on that? So in this example, I could do this simple thing where I say, oh, on the mobile side, I just post, uh, like create a new object, a buy object, saying I want to buy something that has a link to my shopping cart, which is also just an object, of course, with uh, all the stuff I want to buy. And just say, well, I'm not doing anything. I just create this object. But just like you with... Uh, all the new, again, serverless frameworks like Lambda and Azure functions and all these things. On the server, you want to be able to react on things, to be triggered by, by events that happens out there. So the first thing that happens, of course, is that since this is real-time synchronizing, on the server, you see the same object pop up. Just like, bing, it's on this, you have the same object on both sides, just transparently. But the moment this point pops up, you can run some code over there. Say, I mean, it can react on it and say, like, it's like, bing, oh, this triggers an action. In this case, since we're in a shopping cart, that action could be, uh, let's send a request out to Stripe to actually process the user's credit card and everything. So it's just happily going around. Let's no, notice that while it does that, it, it can update the status to say, now I'm processing this. And since this is kind of magically synchronized, it goes right back to the, uh, to the object in the, 
on the mobile device, which again is also reactive, so you can just connect that directly to a UI. So as a developer, you don't even have to update the UI. It'll just say, well, just show the content of that object. And that's pretty nice. And just show, oh, we're, we're processing. And while, while this happens, you can have like connectivity goes, oh, that kind of sucks, right? But it doesn't really do much of a difference. You're just not going to see any updates on the mobile device. Uh, you could also actually have, the, again, the app gets totally restarted, it gets shut down and on the mobile device. And it's like, that kind of sucks. But even while this time, you see on the, the server side, the status changes are done. It's like, oh, Stripe re re returned the reply, and yeah, the, this, uh, like the order went through. It was perfect. So uh, at some point, the, you get connectivity again. The app gets restarted, everything. And it just synchronizes back, and you get the done status in, in, in the app. So in this way, you kind of you abstracted away all the networking. All these problems, like the, the whole thing, and not just the all these issues of going online, offline, shutdown, up, down. Also the, should I pass all the JSON? How do I handle networking? It all just goes away. All the, the developer, he only did two things. He created an object, and he connected that to UI. That's all. And it just works. And on the server side, all they did is he went in and he created an event that says, oh, when an object has been added, run this code, like just some JavaScript code, connect to Stripe, process the order, and, and update the object in return. And that's all. And you kind of removed all these problems. So in this way, you kind of you put yourself, kind of proxy it, or like put yourself in between all the, between the mobile device and all the troublesome backend APIs that was not designed for mobile. And you just simplify the whole architecture in this way and just make it really robust and hardened against all the, the issues you have in the mobile world. So it, it's like a really, really simple mental model of doing it, but it has fascinating effects. And there's a lot of, of side benefits you get from this also because since the server knows everything that's on the, on the client, it can also optimize in the sense that it, doesn't, it never has to send things twice. I mean, this same one, as you see, that's kind of like a link to order info. It can have like a long list of all this, like what, what's the status on the order. I think you can just keep updating the object. And the, the mobile device will always know the status. Or you could, another example would be if you were doing, if you're doing search, for example. You could just make a search object saying, I'm searching for this string. And you would get all the, and, and it will just fill that object with all the results. And then you could change the search string as you go. I mean, like standard, like auto-completing thing if you want. And it would just update with the objects that were, that were added or removed, but it wouldn't have to reset the same object again and again, because again, it knows the state on both sides. So it, you, it basically can work kind of like a small CDN, just optimizing the network traffic, which is really, really effective. Um, so I'll show you a small demo of this. Um, if we have the uh, demo guards working with us here. Um, so what we have here is a, let's take a, a very simple app, uh, I'll show you, have the app running here, so you can see, it basically looks like this. It well, doesn't really look like that, right? <laughs> but I can help that. Let me see if we can, here we go, we're sneaking in. Okay, here we go. So this is an app, it's running in the simulator, of course, but it, it, that's how it will look on a mobile device. And let's see if we can make it even more fun to show the actual code as well and that is in that app. Uh, we are, this is a bit harder than you would expect to drag this thing in, but okay. So this is the code from the actual app. So what, what we're seeing here is the, the data model. So this one is a small scanner app. So it, it can basically scan and recognize text is the idea. Uh, by using uh, like an external serverless service. Um, so it has a, this is a class, uh, just a simple object that has this a scan, it has a status, it has some image data. Uh, and the idea, of course, is that we want to fill that in and we kind of want to fill it, fill it up when you, when you do something over here. The interesting part is that on the, on the server side, we have something responsive, the same thing, basically. Uh, let's move that in here as well. happening. Here we go. So this is the, the corresponding code on the server side, which is JavaScript code, the response. So this is uh, basically a notification callback to say, oh, when this, this object changes, give me all the object, label scanner objects, which has a status that they are uploading. And 
then it will change the status to processing, and it will after this it will do a lot of stuff. It will just contact uh, all the stuff you have to do to contact Google's uh, image scan API, basically. Um, so it just do that, and wh when it has, pr then it'll process the whole thing, and when it's done at some point, it'll just update the result with, with both with the result of the scan and of course the status. Um, so if we look at how that actually works in action, if we have this one and we say, click want to scan, let's we'll choose a, something from the library. And this is just a small photo of some text. We say, okay, we want to scan. So you can see it says processing and complete. It was pretty quick. I hope you didn't miss it. But actually, it did say just it, it processing and it was completed. And we get all the scan results here from this. And of course, the thing is that it's a very, very, very simple use case. It's just calling out to an external like Google's API in this case. But again, this one is totally protected. Again, you could have lost connectivity at any point in time. The app could have been shut down and restarted. And it wouldn't have, you wouldn't have to do anything. And if you look from a development perspective, if we look at the, the code here, the, the actual code that the developer has to write is minimal. Uh, it's a bit hard to see from this angle what I actually should click on. Uh, but basically, when, when you do this, you just use what's in, in iOS, what's called KVC, which is uh, a KVO, which is basically allowing you to observe objects. It's just a standard language feature. It's not even something that's specific to the database. You just observe that object for changes. And it just say, oh, every time this object changes, it's called this called observe value, call this callback and update the UI. So it's extremely simple. There's, again, there's no networking code on this, the client side, on the mobile device at all. It just works. Uh, so, so I think it's something that you should consider, not necessarily doing like this, but just think about, OK, every, all of you who are building serverless services, give it the extra thought and say, OK, when we are on mobile, when, when our users are on mobile, how are they going to interact with this? I mean, how are we going to protect them so that no matter what happens in their app or, and with the networking and the connectivity, how do we ensure that the app still works, that it doesn't break in all kind of unpredictable manners? And so it's not just, because that's just a really bad experience, of course, for everybody. So, I mean, there's a lot of use case for this. I mean, the, the, this idea of having shared state can, can be used to all kinds of things. The, the most obvious one, of course, is just sharing data. I mean, uh, I think some of them come, came by our booth and they kind of saw the, the demos we have of, of doing collaboration where you can have like live shared data. I mean, that, that's awesome in itself. It's kind of an obvious thing and you, can, you want apps to be live, engaging, and, and you can like play with things and it feels real instant and real time. But that's just one thing. I mean, and the, the, the API bridging is actually really, really important. This idea that you can access the whole world of APIs out there in a manner that's just safe and, and extremely easy for the developers to work with. Uh, we have the same thing with connectors, where you connect, you basically connect to existing databases, which is also if you have like database as a service, you basically can make a connector, say, what if we could just expose that as objects? And so you don't have to have any kind of calls back and forth. It all just works. Uh, and then you want, of course, you want to be able to push data, and you want to be able to stream data back from the devices. But that's all the same. It's either like putting objects in on one side or putting, putting objects in on the other side. So basically, you take all, all these, seems to vary to separate things, and you can just generalize it to one single concept. So the developer only had to learn one thing. It's all just objects. We kind of have this thing where we kind of say objects all the way down. And it's kind of, it, it makes, really, really simplifies the whole stack. Um, so the, the, what are the key benefits? Of course, the key benefits is, is that you abstract away the networking. I mean, that is really, really huge. You don't have to think about it. It's not something you have to worry about. Uh, it just works. Uh, the networking basically don't exist for you. You just work with objects. And also this really cool idea that you have this unified data model, that you have the same objects, you have the same reactivity, like the ability to observe and react and changes in objects. You have that both on the client and on the server. So it's just like one mental model of how you work with things. It just makes, just like you really like to have the same language on both sides. It's like, that's why Node.js is so popular, right? That you can kind of have just one language. The idea that you can have one data model and one way of interacting with it is really powerful. And then this cool thing that you can actually just bind, to the, when you have objects, you can just bind them directly to UI. So that also just removes like tons of complexity. So to summarize, 
I mean, the, the whole thing, just the first thing to learn is just say, oh, mobile is really different from the web. It's just a different world. You just have to think about things in a different way. The fact that you have high latency connectivity that's unstable, can just go, come and go as it, as it happens, and apps that can just get restarted anytime. Like, it can happen constantly. That's just a, a different world, and you kind of have to get used to that and say, okay, how do we, how do we deal with this? Um, and that's the world we've been living in for many, many years now, where you just, and you just say, okay, how do we deal with the, all these small problems? And it is really dangerous. If you just build apps the way you used to build, again, they will work to begin with, and then you'll just get to start hitting the edge cases when you start getting lots of users, and you start getting to like Asia, where they have all kind of weird devices that has uh, small memory and small processing, and you're like, how do you, how do you even start debugging that? Uh, it gets pretty horrible. Uh, and just, I mean, the, the whole idea of doing API calls is just brittle when you're in that kind of environment. So you really want something better, uh, something else. Um, shared objects is one way, there might be other ways, but it's definitely something you want to keep in mind. Like, how do, how do you build APIs for that? Um, so, so we think the right solution is just to say, objects are the new API. It's, it's such a simple model. I mean, you just post objects and you can react on them. And you can do anything any REST API could do, anything, even something like GraphQL could do, everything. It's just, it's just objects, simple. Um, so that's pretty much it. So if you have any questions, there is one down there. Exactly. So the question was, how does that scale? Well, I mean, when, because obviously you have all these objects, suddenly you have a lot of state, which is, uh, of course, the problem. You have, you have to track state for every single object. And it's true, that is uh, in, in a lot, because you can have, again, every single mobile device might have millions. I mean, we have users who have like double digit millions of endpoints out there. Um, but I mean, what our kind of perspective on this is, it's kind of like what we call kind of endpoint virtualization where you really want to think that you have like a, a virtual instance of all your endpoints on your server. Um, the, th the idea, of course, is that this is extremely lightweight. I mean, objects uh, take off hardly any space. I mean, they're, they're, they're really small, you can spin them up, and it's, it's, it's like micro super light containers for data, right? <laughs> so just as you would spin up like Docker containers, pretty light, I mean, this is like, a millifraction of the resource to do that. That you just spin up a small data container, we call it a realm, uh, small data container, and you do that for each. So in our experience, it, it spins up, and we have single servers that have been able to handle up to like 100,000 connections. So, so, I mean, but you're different, I mean, if you have millions and millions of users, you're gonna have scale issues, as with anything uh, you have to deal with. Did that answer your question? Yeah, that's all. Uh, the question was, so you, you had the, the whole thing, okay, you're offline, somebody's offline, and people change the same objects at the same time. And of course, at some point, they meet each other, and you're like, well, conflict. <laughs> how, how, do we, how do we deal with that? So that, that is actually the main thing we deal with. And if you say, okay, what, what was the reason of existence for Realm part of it, is this idea of how to deal with conflicts. Because that is the reality, again. It's, I didn't go into that part, but that's the other thing. The consequence of being offline, and even just the, the consequence of having high latency. Because even if we have perfect connectivity, we are like, they are both on the network, it works perfectly. If we're doing a change at the same time, just because of the latency, we're gonna have conflicts. So conflicts happens all the time, constantly. Um, and that's also, I mean, with the REST API, you're just, yeah, you're just in trouble <laughs> when that happens. What, what we do, because we have an object model, and because it's, it's a real database that actually works, we, we, know everything the user do. I mean, we know not just that he updated the object, we know how he updated the object in what context. It means that you can send extremely rich information to the server about what happened. And that allows us to actually handle merge conflicts. 
So what, what we do is, I mean, uh, for those of you who are very technical, essentially our data structure is like one big CRDT. So that's uh, called like commutative replicated data type, which is kind of a very nerdy academic thing. But what it means in essence is that all changes happens when they conflict, they will get resolved in a deterministic manner. So as a developer, you will know that, oh, when, if I have two people chase this, it's gonna end up in this result at the same time. So some of them are very similar. If you have, let's say you have a list and you have people appending data to the list. If you have, have two people appending data to the list in this, at the same time, you know because of the nature of the data structure that it will end up in one list where these objects all are added in the order that they were added. So they'll kind of interleave as they go. And all the, the whole data structure is built like that. So that is the key thing. We make sure that as a developer you don't have to worry too much about that. You have to understand the basic rules, but the moment you understand the consistency rules, you can just let it go, basically. And that's, that's, you never have to manually resolve conflicts. Did that answer your questions? Yeah, uh, If somebody, everybody wants to go deep into it, I'm, I mean, you can come to our booth and I'll be happy to talk for hours and hours about <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, the question down here. Yes, it does. So the question was, does, does Realm support different scopes? Can you have basically different sharing rules for different objects? And it does. I mean, the, again, think of the Realm as a, as a mini data container that you can spin up as many of as you want. Uh, you can literally have millions of them. And every one of them can have their own sharing rules. They basically all have like an ACL where you can say like, this, this Realm is shared with these two users. This Realm is shared with this public for everybody. This Realm is, is just for this single user. This guy only had read access to it. This guy only had write access to it. Um, so in most cases when we see apps, you will have like multiple different realms open in the same app with different sharing rules. Um, so for example, if you want to do like a chat app, you would say like, uh, if you want to do something like Slack, for example, you would say every channel is just a realm and it'll, it's just shared with those people who are members of that channel. Um, so very simple model. Any other questions? Okay, well, always, you're always welcome to come to our booth and just talk with us. Thanks a lot, guys. We've got a snack break outside. <laughs>